on to the broadcast. Um, we uh, apologize for the technical difficulties there. We, uh, our, our computer uh, had a, uh, uh, a moment of silence. <laughs> 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 and uh, we, uh, we apologize for that. Just speaking of that, I'm going to mention this, and I'll mention it at the end, Heather, you remind me. But um, the ministry here at Crossline Television is in need of a new computer. Uh, we have one here that's working, but as you know, um, as, you saw. <laughs> as you saw, rather, sometimes it uh, decides to take a nap. <laughs> and uh, we just pray that um, if you feel led, uh, to give towards that effort, we need about three thousand dollars is what we need to buy a new do new machine uh, to run the network live. And so, mm -hmm. uh, praise God. Let's get back into the scriptures. But um, I want to open up by just reading this again and um, asking the Lord to continue to reveal to us the meaning of these. He says that in verse eighteen of Hebrews chapter six is where we are. If you're just uh, tuning in. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, 18, that by two immutable things, in that which it was impossible for God to lie. Boy, that ought to speak to us right there. You know, it's impossible for God to lie. We can't understand that, can we? Because uh, we lie. We lie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's something we deal with on a daily basis at, at, at times. But it's impossible for God to lie. Uh, that we might have a strong encouragement. You know, I'm encouraged in the fact that I have and I serve a God who's not going to lie to me. He's not going to do me wrong. He's given me protection. He becomes my refuge. He becomes my strength. You know, um, he becomes my correction. He, re he becomes Christ. Literally, when we're born again, we don't belong to us anymore. Right. We belong to Christ. That's right. And therefore, he's... He's transforming me, he's correcting me, he's making me, molding me, shaping me into his image. And that should give us encouragement that uh, I don't have to walk, upon, uh, to walk upon that which is leading me the wrong way. I can know, and this is why Paul taught us in Romans 6, uh, 3, uh, 6, 6, and 6, 9, that there's something I've got to know, there's something I've got to completely understand. And, and it's this, that my old man has been crucified with Christ and I have been raised up to live for God by a new power source. I've been raised up to live for God by faith in his finished work, which gives me everything I'll need as it pertains to life and godliness. And so this is God's plan. And so he wants every single believer to have a strong encouragement. He wants every believer to have a strong confidence in him. This is why he says, I don't change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God just changed every day, that would breed confusion, wouldn't it? If God changed every day, we wouldn't be so sure of our God. But the Bible doesn't say that. It says that he changes not. Therefore, I can have a strong confidence. I can have a full assurance. I can rest in what he's done for me and know that it's going to be the same thing when I wake up tomorrow. Glory to God. You know, um, this, this phrase set before us matches and goes right along with Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us weigh aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That says less about... Um, Setting down, I think, the weight of sin, realizing that that man's just dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and running the race, the only way we can continue to run the race is verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame that we walked in, right? The shame mm, of our nakedness. Sure. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Um, the work that he did, that he came to do, he did at the cross when he endured it, and his work is finished. That's right. right? And, if, and if we pay uh, little attention to that, to that finished work, then... Taking it lightly. If we're taking it lightly, what Christ did at the cross, and we're, you know, a lot of uh, these, these other churches, and, and, you know, a lot of them are just, they're doing all they know to do. 
and they're preaching salvation for the cross, but they don't understand, they haven't been given the understanding of sanctification yet. I don't say that boastfully or proudfully. I, I'm thankful every day that I understand what, what little I do. But we can see today's modern church, they're, they're, they're falling away because they've paid little attention to the cross of Calvary. Or they don't, or they've never they've heard They've made little this. of what actually took place there. Mm-hmm. What actually took place there was not only a death, but it was what caused us to begin to have a relationship with our Savior again. Re- relationship without the blood equals no relationship at all. You, you, we can't even come to God in worship, in praise. I know we all, when we come into church and we have our, our time of worship and praise, you know, one of the things that I think the Holy Spirit has taught me in that time when we're worshiping Him is that's a time to be reminded and reflect upon the blood of Christ. That's a time to be uh, reminded and thankful and have a heart of thanksgiving uh, because of what he did, his precious blood that was shed there. We can't even worship in spirit and in truth without having the blood of Jesus at the forefront. That's why I love it that we, we sang hymns back in, you know, when we pastored the church there in spring. I love to sing the hymns because they always speak uh, of the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and not that other songs or whatever Don't, the case right, is. It, it doesn't make anything wrong or right. But what I'm saying is this. We approach God only on the basis of the blood of Jesus. Period. Exclamation mark right there. We can only approach Jesus, our God, we can only have fellowship, we can only have correction, we can only have uh, his power on the basis of the blood of Jesus. I can only worship God on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, I was thinking as you're talking, um, the bloodline that came to Christ through the Holy Spirit was perfect and sinless. Um, so it only makes sense that we couldn't come to God in and of ourselves because our bloodline is tainted. It's evil. It's sinful in inclination and, and, um, the, uh, but he did away with that. He crucified that man. That man is dead. Now we have a new bloodline and a new way of approaching. We've got a new body, which is Christ's now. So now um, th- his death was, was vicarious. It was efficacious. So we would, it, it, when God looks at us, he sees us hidden in Christ. So the blood that he sees, right? Mm-hmm. When I see the blood, I will pat the death angel would pass over, um, is Christ's, not ours. We are hidden in Christ. We're in his body. It's almost like, um, he just took our spirit. In fact, he did. Mm-hmm. He took our spirit, our soul, placed it in Christ's body. And now when we approach him by faith in what he's done, I know that we, we've repeated this, but I was just thinking about it and seeing it in a new light um, based on the blood. We approach him. That's the only way we could come boldly before the throne of grace. The hope that he's talking about here is only through the blood. And so if we pay little attention to that, and, and once again, that's where uh, most of the modern church, if not just about all of it, has run into the ground, is to where they, they pay little attention to uh, faith in the cross, and they pay more attention to uh, man's own strength, his own ideas, his own philosophies, his own, uh, uh, you know, whatever you fill in the blank. Man has a whole list of things that he's trying to, to introduce to the church today to try to get the church in. But once again, um, you know, I I ministered a message when we were in Houston about discerning the body of Christ. Okay. Um, If if we are Christ and we're born again, truly born again, and we're trying to approach things in our own strength and will, uh, it's as though we are in our hearts, we believe that God will accept our tainted blood. 
Yeah. We're trying to still approach inside the dead man when we've been placed in Christ. So uh, approaching things that way is a lie. And that's why God can't be around that. That's why God, the Holy Spirit, said in his word um, to deny yourself. If you're not denying the ability, talent. if you're not denying yourself, then you cannot be his disciple. You're rejecting. You're rejecting Christ. what it is he provided. Right, right. Um, that's the whole the whole issue is what. OK, what are you presenting to God? What are we presenting to God? Is it our ability, our talent or what? Or is it faith? God only accepts faith. You're not going to come to God outside of the blood of Christ. You know, we got liars in the body of Christ today by the bucket loads. We've got the, 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 the Oprah Winfrey's, the T.D. Jakes, the Ken Copeland's, all these TV preachers. My God, if you're watching them, turn it off. There ain't, they ain't doing nothing but spewing out garbage. All these people that are flocking together on this, on this deception network called TBN and, and Daystar and all these people. Understand, if they're not pointing you exclusively only to faith in Christ and Him crucified, they're leading you down a dead-end road. It's another way. It's another Jesus, and it's another gospel. That's what Paul, Paul said. said. Yep. And so if we're going to be uh, without doubt and without unbelief in our heart, we need this strong consolation. We need for the Lord to build strong consolation in us. You know, the encouragement comes by the power of the Holy Spirit, but yet I still believe he's building encouragement in us on a daily basis as we're resting and trusting in him. Well, and the part that we were talking about in the last hour was, um, you know, in, in realizing that, our, that we're dead, that we're crucified, removed out of the way, and alive unto God through Christ Jesus, there is life that abides in that. We have a hope for not just being in heaven, uh, although that's not to be understated, um, I don't want to demean that by any means. Um, the, the, the greatest thing we have is that we're going to get a glorified body and we're going to live forever with him in his presence. But, you know, he said he came to give us life and life more abundantly for now while we're here. And again, just like we covered last hour, that's not talking about, um, that's, not a, that's a focus first on soul prosperity. He's going to prosper our soul before he's going to bless us um, physically, financially, uh, all of that. Why? Because when we're seeking the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, then he adds everything to us. But it doesn't go in reverse. And since he's an unchanging God, the word says immutable then he's not going to compromise either. It's like the Cain and Abel story, and we won't go too much into it, but God only accepts the blood. He only accepts the blood sacrifice that Abel brought. He does not present, uh, accept the, the works of our hands that we present to him. Why does God, in his infinite wisdom, want us and our souls to prosper first? The answer is simple. He cares about you making heaven your home. He desires that none should perish, but that all should come to this knowledge and stay and continue in this race. So many times in the book of Hebrews, we're warned uh, of that two little two letter word called if, if we will hold fast, if we will keep the confidence unto the end, so to speak. So whenever we we wake up each morning, this thing called Christianity, it should always be about our soul prospering first. I should have more love each day. I should have more love than I had last week. I should be more kind uh, to my spouse each and every day. Those are just some <laughs> examples of what he died for for us to have. Amen. You know, we're, whoever said that... Uh, Christianity was easy, lied to you. It, we know it's not easy. Living by faith, Living by faith by is, is going to be the hardest thing you ever had to do in life. Now, with that said, what God, we, we know we have to fight for the faith. 
That's what Paul taught us. That bear, scripture bears that out. But what God wants to produce along the way in this journey of the fight of faith, God wants to produce a mindset that says, man, I'm really beginning to rest in Christ. I'm really beginning to have a confidence in him. I'm really beginning to rely upon him for every circumstance in my life. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Whenever we talk about fighting for the faith, God doesn't want it to be a fight. God just wants you to trust. God wants you to rest. Are you with me? You know, um, as you were talking. In other words, what I'm trying to say, and I said it poorly, but we're, as we are Believing him as we are fighting for this faith, it should produce a rest in us eventually. Absolutely. And what I was thinking as you were saying that is I was thinking, you know, the more we eat and drink this, meaning the more we we uh, are learning of Christ and him crucified and continuing to believe in that. Whereas we're talking about our default position and our natural inclination is to look to self, what he's doing uh, Romans 12 and 2, and be not conformed to the to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, and he says by the washing of the water of the word that, you know, uh, the reason why he says it that way, what he's wanting is to take us from having a default mindset of self to transforming our mind to retreat to victory, yeah. to retreat to the cross so that our first inclination is not to go to flesh and, and self-strength. Our first inclination is to look to the cross and live. That's it. That's what he's trying to get us to do, exactly. to live by the way of the cross and not by the means of flesh. It goes back to what I was stating the other day about God. He's, he's clearing off the land, so to right, speak. Right, right. Um, you, you bought a five acre track and it's all wooded when we become christians and we're born again it's all wooded mm -hmm. we, we've got mess that's got to be cleared off and little by little god begins to clear off that land so we can possess the land so we can walk in what he has uh, provided for us on the cross of calvary and so he wants as heather rightly said to to produce a mindset that is a mindset that retreats right back to where victory was won, which was at the cross. And so that is the, that's the job of the Holy Spirit, though. we, we got to get there. That's the process that's he the does. That's the process he does. You know, we, our job as ministers is to preach the word. That's what Paul taught Timothy. He says, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. If we're to preach the scriptures then the scriptures are always pointing to Christ well, and what he did on the cross. And, and I think, you know, what you said, I, I think the Lord's been kind of talking to me a lot about the last few days is, is that very thing. Because when we give people our opinions, uh, when, we, when we give them anything other than this gospel, we hinder. And not just that, this gospel, what Christ did at Calvary is life. It's breath put back into the body of Christ. And when we do, when we give them anything other than that and that alone, uh, what we're doing is hindering the body. We're feeding poison instead of life. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's got to be the pure gospel. You know, and, and none of us have, have arrived. You know, I know that there's a lot of us, even those that, of us that minister this message, um, and we, we try to do it exclusively. We're all learning. Right? right? We're all learning, but I think he's been talking to me a lot about not always giving my opinion about things, and, and unless it pertains to this gospel specifically, mm -hmm. uh, that I really need to try to leave it alone, because it's, not, it's only going to hurt folk uh, as much as I might think I'm helping. Right, it, it has to pertain to the scriptures, and the scriptures have to always be in context. They have to always be in context of Christ and him crucified. If they're not in that context, then uh, you need to throw that out. You just need to get away from that. I want to bring in a verse of scripture here. Um, if you look at chapter 7, mm -hmm. verse 28. Whoa. In chapter, chapter 7, you skipped all the way to verse 28? Yeah. I'm, just bringing I'm, in a scripture. I'm bringing in a reference here. I'm there. Okay. Chapter 7, verse 28 uh, in the book of Hebrews. For the law maketh men 
high priest, which have infirmity. Mm, see? For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity. But the word of the oath. The oath is the cross. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. Okay. The oath is the promise. The promised seed, Isaac, who was of the, Jesus was of the lineage. We understand what, all through the scripture, what this is pointing to. The oath was the contract that God made in the new covenant between man and himself. But it was God's contract. Man had nothing, no say over it. This is my way. You either accept it and it's the way of the cross or you reject it. Now, with that said, uh, He's talking about man, how man has an infirmity, the infirmity of the flesh, Paul would talk about. And he understands that, but the, but, big old but right there, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, did you catch that? Ooh, my Lord, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. So this contract that he's given us, God came in human form. Man couldn't be redeemed unless God have, have come in human form. There was not a man on this planet that could have kept the law perfectly. Why? Because man was born with infirmity. Mm -hmm. And so right here, this one that was consecrated forevermore was consecrated because he wasn't born like we were. He was we're talking about the blood. He was talking about his death. Right. It, this is all pointing to the death. And so we can see right here, and the reason I brought that scripture in is because he talks about that oath, mm -hmm. which is what we're dealing with in chapter 6. This, right. This contract that God made between uh, man and himself. You know, when we're talking about the oath, you said the word contract, and the first thing that popped to my mind is, you know, when we first came to Christ, we realized we need help needed help and so it's almost like when you go through online or something and you have to click that you agree mm -hmm. to this new version on your phone like say you're going to update your phone you have to agree to it and click agree but we really don't know what all those changes are that are going to take place that are going to occur um, all of the debugging and the things we really don't know what's really wrong what they're saying that they're going to fix but we clicked agree when we put our faith in christ and what we're learning every single day when we're reading this word in light of what Christ did at Calvary is we're learning the details of that contract, the oath that was taken, that, God, that, that, that Christ took on behalf. For him, it wasn't just an oath. It was, um, we think of an oath as something that you swear. You know, I swear on a Bible, I give an oath um, before we give a testimony in court or something, but an oath speaks uh, in, in Americanized language, speaks more of a covenant, a contract. Um, with a contract, there's things you have to agree to and, and the contract can be breached in this area or another. When we abide in anything other, trust in anything other than what Christ has done at Calvary, we breach the contract. And so all of the blessings uh, that, that occur, we can't have except we once again don't breach it by having faith in what he's done. Right. And, and you know, let's throw this in there because it is possible. You know, I, I made a statement on social media this morning that um, hearing without heeding equals hardness of heart. Hearing without heeding equals hardness of heart. Mm -hmm. So if we're just hearing the word and it's just kind of there and we're just kind of fumbling through life every day. Oh, I'm, I've got the word of God here. But we're not applying it. Somebody says, well, how do I apply it? Thank you, you apply it by faith. Believing. You, you, apply, you apply it by believing, and then the evidence that you truly believe it is the Holy Spirit being able to give you power to accomplish being obedient to the word. And there's a process in learning how to believe because I've been at the place um, where I could see I wasn't believing and I, I realized um, if you're not careful, you'll make believing a work, if that makes sense. So it, in the, you know, the, like you said yesterday, one of the best prayers ever prayed is Lord help my unbelief. 
And as we grow and we continue in this process and continue to allow him um, to have his way, then slowly but surely we do come to the place where we realize and we do believe in areas that we hadn't before. That's right. You know, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil, uh, whether the forerunner is for us, entereth even Jesus, made an high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now he's fixing to begin speaking about Melchizedek, uh, who was uh, the greatest type of Christ, I believe we see in the scriptures, maybe other than Moses, but we, we you know, the, the Bible's about Jesus, period. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you're not going to make anything else out of the scriptures but Jesus. But he's bringing in this idea uh, that uh, Christ has become our great high priest. After the order, in other words, uh, it was Abraham who paid tithes to Melchizedek. Melchizedek being a picture, a typology of Christ. But when we look at the fullness of of what God has provided. We, we, we teach in this ministry what God is instructing us to teach. Don't ever think for a minute that my wife and I don't seek the Lord on what it is we're supposed to teach you every day. Um, that would be a very foolish thing of me to do, is, is to just say, oh, well, let's go through this or let's go through that. We're diligently seeking the Lord on what it is uh, that can help somebody. And <clears throat> the Lord, the Lord sees everything. He sees right down to the core. He sees the condition that his church is in right now, which is uh, most likely worse than the condition that the children of Israel were in in Egyptian slavery. The, the, the children today of God are in such a condition that we, we, we don't see, we're not able to see properly because we've left the cross. The, so we're seeking each and every day, what, what are we going uh, to be able to give God? Uh, what, are we, what, what can help somebody? That is our desire, is to see the church come out of this slavery that they're in today. They, they're in change today. They don't think they're in change. They don't know they're in change, but the, the ch God's children are in bondage. They're in chains. I've said this a million times, but if we're not instructed in the way of righteousness properly, then we're going to go and run to a work or to a law. And we're going to think that that law is going to earn us some kind of merit with God. Mm -hmm. And so we got to be very careful how we instruct people. And so it puts a heck of a responsibility, not only upon myself and Heather, but all these other ministers that are preaching the cross. If we're not teaching people in the way of righteousness, which is the righteousness Christ provided on the cross, they're going to, they're going to go to their default position. If we're not pointing them to the cross of Calvary, there is no help for them. And so we want to be sure that our hope is in Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. That's our only hope. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Absolutely. You know, and when we're fixing the cover, talking about Melchizedek, um, I mean, I don't want to jump ahead of it, uh, but most people know that tied to Melchizedek is tithing. Um, and I don't know if we, if we hammer on this enough when we do gospel a thon and such, but um, once again, just like approaching God for righteousness, for uh, blessing, for anything, we've got to begin with having the proper faith. If we have the proper faith, um, then the proper works will follow. That's right. You know, the cross... It is going to always, always, always put an end to all disputes and all strife, all arguments, all, all any, any place that mankind falls short, whether it's through jealousy, whether it's through envy, and, and all those things, they're in the heart. They're, they're in the heart. And I'll say this today, that it's going to take some time for those things to be 
changed. It, God, God's not in a hurry. He, he takes his time <laughs> as he is sanctifying us. And he makes sure that the problem is rooted out. Right. And rooted out. And so the cross puts an end to all disputings. It puts an end to all of man's flaws. The, min the minute we want to blame and throw the, throw the blame game and begin to look at somebody else and their faults is the minute we better be looking back to Calvary and looking at our own. Well, you know, and, and uh, I think... Sin is a buffet, eat off your own plate. You know, he says whenever we look at our brother and we're worried about the, the speck in our brother's eye, but we ha can't even notice the beam in our own, you know, uh, we've got a whole lot wrong with us. Focusing on others is not, that's, 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 that's the Holy Spirit's work in correcting those things. We're not to correct other folk. What we're to do is to, to realize what we are and our need for Christ, like you said, and to focus on him and allow him to, you know, that, that's where you've just, you've got to pray for other people. And I don't mean pray for them um, when you, before you had that trial where you had your, your wreck and your brain injury. I used to ask God, the way I prayed for my husband um, was really very selfish. I used to, instead of, of asking God to bless him, I could see his fault and I prayed that God fix that fault and God fix that fault. And then my husband, a few days after praying like this, uh, the Lord reminded me, my husband had his wreck and I think a few days after that, when the suffering really began to set in and the realization of what was going on, the Lord reminded me of those things I prayed for you. And while he was accomplishing what it is I asked for, I said to the Lord when I realized that, I said, Lord, that's not what I meant. Sure. I didn't mean it like that. And um, the trial you went through also became my trial. And what I realized is that I could hinder you based on the way I prayed for you. Meaning, I was trying to correct you by going to God with your problems rather than, rather than realizing what a mess I was. Um, and he, he did... He did do those things, but it came by much suffering, and, um, you know, I suffered along in that area, and I realized, man, it isn't my job to correct you. Sure. That's my job to depend on him to correct me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we got to look to ourselves, obviously, first. There's, there's no, you know, most people understand that. But they, it's well, hard. I didn't. It's hard. <laughs> I didn't. It's hard for them to do that. You know, you, the only way anybody's going to be able to see themselves is to see the cross. Right. To look Calvary to the cross. Shows you you look to the cross. The cross tells and it teaches us that that man can't do it, and we got to have God's help um, through everything. But Christ, what what Paul is getting ready uh, to deal with here, and once again, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. So what he's getting ready to do is he's he's setting up, I think, for a new thought, and this new thought he's. He, he's just basically hitting Christ from every angle possible. And he's getting ready to give them the idea that we are ministers of a better covenant based upon better promises. And so these promises of God that we have been given are, are to pre be presented to the people and, and to teach the people that, listen, there's no need to go back to that which is old. There's no need to go back that which has been done away with. The, the new covenant teaches us, ladies and gentlemen, that we are no longer under the bondage and legalism of a law. But we, however, God has given us the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that gives us free power that gives us dominion and rule over that which we were. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's basically, in a nutshell, uh, the new covenant. And so, um, you know, I'm thankful for the, for the new covenant promise that we have a new covenant based upon better promises. Amen. And, and I believe this is Paul setting up here uh, for that next thought as we go into chapter 7 and 8. And... Um, it's taken us quite some time to move through chapter six, but it's been powerful. It's been good. It's, it's been, been really powerful. Good. And blessing. obviously the, we know the chapters and verses were put in the Bible just so we can communicate with one another where to turn. That was their purpose. That was their reasoning. Paul, 
his thoughts it's really continued. it's continued he's just hitting he's just hitting the cross from different angles all through the book of Hebrews all which, through anything he wrote really which is which is all we can do as ministers mm -hmm. is point people to Christ and what he did and if we point people to anything besides faith in the cross God help us because you're not going to be helping them you're going to you're going to be destroying them you I'm here to tell you I taught Bible studies for a long time and I was destroying God's people I was I was teaching them man you've got to you've got to celebrate festivals you've got to wear your little beanie hat you've got, you've got to fast you've Prayer, got to pray yeah. I was destroying people with my words and, um, thank God for his grace today. Amen, amen. thank God for his grace well I thank you for joining us today on the broadcast and um, it's been a pleasure as always I, we would ask you to pray uh, for this ministry on a continual basis and we would ask you to sow into it financially. Um, there's, not a, there's not a time period. I know we have Gospel Thon um, uh, first weekend of every month because we have uh, a great big pile of bills that are due uh, so the network doesn't go down. But uh, during the month, we need your help as well. I mentioned a while ago about uh, we had some computer problems and this computer has been doing that quite often to me. I don't know why, uh, but uh, we need it's to been a good faithful it. computer it's we been just a good faithful computer we've had it i think three years now and, and we've um, worked it hard we've we have put that thing through <laughs> a lot but it's getting to a place to where we're going to have to replace it and we need three thousand dollars to do that so if you can sow financially uh into that we would sure very much appreciate it and so Amen. um we're going to close and uh we'll be back with you tuesday and Tuesday, Heather, is going to be number 300. Wow. The, thir the 300th 300 <laughs> broadcast for our show. The, the 300th episode of the Following the Way of the Cross broadcast. I remember when we did the 100th, uh, and it was just Crossline Radio back then, and we made a big right. celebration. It was a big deal. 200 came along. I don't think we, we, we did so much, but 300, it's like, wow, that's really, uh, that's a lot. Well, praise the Lord. It doesn't seem like that. You though. know, it, it's... Um, we're going to continue uh, yep. until he comes. There's nothing else to do. Amen. And so praise the Lord. We love each and every one of you. We'll see you uh, Tuesday morning uh, live here on the broadcast. Bye-bye.